Welcome to Beyond the Breakwater, where just beyond the crashing waves of fear, discomfort, and doubt lies the greatest potential for life transformation. We want to guide you into the open waters where the calculated risk you take becomes the turning point for you or your organization to thrive. So drop your anchors and prepare for departure in this week's episode of Beyond the Breakwater. Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Beyond the Breakwater. Um, My name is Lindsay, and with me today is Ed. Welcome, Ed. Great to be here, Lindsay. It's been a lot of fun doing this together with you. It has. I feel like we need a name for our listeners, like something with Beyond the Breakwater-esque in there, like a theme. So maybe we'll think of that one so we can welcome people um, differently next time. Um, But Ed, what are we going to be talking about today? I think today's a really exciting topic because we're going to talk about beyond uh, Midland, Michigan. You know, like right now we've been we've been sharing about what we're doing uh, locally and how it's been very transformational in the lives of of people in our community. But we know that this model works. Uh, we've seen it. We've seen it work um, even in a small scale in other locations because we've met with other cities uh, who are wanting to do some of the things that we're doing. Uh, but today we're going to go beyond that. Uh, today we're actually going to entitle this one Beyond the Border. And and the reason why it's Beyond the Border is because does this model, does what we're doing, uh, the whole concept of not doing a handout, um, and I don't like the term hand up, I don't really like that, but it's really allowing people to do it for themselves. Uh, you just came back from a trip to Mexico, mm-hmm. and you got to see firsthand uh, some of the things that we're doing here uh, over in Mexico. So why don't you maybe give us an overview of what what did you do in Mexico? Yeah, it was really interesting. So I did just get back from from Mexico. We were about 90 miles south of the border of the, the California-Mexico border in a, in a town called Ensenada. Um, so it was interesting because I went last year on this trip. Um, and this year it was like so much different, I think, just because of the perspective change that I've had in the last year. And just as we've been talking about um, who Alice is and being able to see that model at play in another country. And it was kind of the first time I was like, huh, like we've been talking about American history up until this point, but this model was very much at play in Mexico. And so there were a lot of differences there. But um, to to kind of recap what that trip was, is a group of us from the church went down um, and built two homes for two working families there. Um, so working families look a little bit different than they do here, there. Um, for example, they're, they're all working. Um, and this city is a very, it's a pretty un, unsafe, unclean um, place that th- this is described by them. This is not from, from me, but just the, the organization we go through, Baja Bound. So these families are living um, in mountainous regions. They're, um, it's very like dusty there. Um, so a lot of the homes that they're living in are tents or oftentimes just tarps draped over um, some type of structure, whether that be like sticks or, or wood or whatnot. Um, and so a lot of these families, they are working, all of them are working, and they have to own the land that they're on to qualify for us to come and build a house. They just don't have the labor to do so. So we come, provide the labor, we pay for and raise money for the materials for them to build this house, but the families have to own that land. Um, now, the parents, they are working, the dad of the, the family that we built for, so there were two teams. So I'm just going to speak to the house that I was building for and the family I was building for and with. Um, so the dad would wake up every morning at like 3 a.m., walk down to the nearest field and pick until... 10, 10 a.m., pick tomatoes, pick whatever was growing in that field. He would come back up at 10 and work with us. um, And his wife, um, Graciela, was working with us and their three-year-old daughter the whole time. And that was a layer of importance, too, to say that we want these families to work with us. us. It's important that they have some, some equity in this process as well, that this is their home. It's not just something that Americans came, showed up, and did it for them and left. But they they have some some stick, skin in the game there too. Let's talk a little bit more about that because I think on the surface it could really be like question. Um, and I know along the way I've questioned it. We've done this for I think the last fifteen or eighteen years. We've gone down to Mexico to do this. That when you take a group of Americans and you send them into another country and they're doing it appears to be they're doing something for somebody else that they can actually do for themselves. 
So kind of walk us through. So you guys went down there mm -hmm. and they own the land mm -hmm. um, and they're having to work with you. So you're providing labor, mm -hmm. um, additional labor with them. And the per people that you're serving with um, are providing the land so that you can build the house on. Um, it can almost give the impression that you're doing something for them that mm -hmm. they can actually do. So what's the barriers that they have for doing this by themselves? Yeah, so they, they, one, they just don't have the labor um, and the materials as well. So a lot of that, like we paid for the materials. Um, so all of the the boards, the nails, the the paintbrushes, the paint, all the supplies is paid for. Um, and then, like I said, the family owns that plot of land that they're on. They have the sweat equity in building that as well. And I believe they had kind of changed the model over the years. So Baja Bound was started in 1994. Um, they started out, I believe, by not charging anything. Um, but then some of the families would turn around and just sell the home. Mm. So they they changed that so that families, okay, you have to own that land. So that way it's not just, okay, we have an asset, sell it, leave, and do what with it. Um, but there was this really, really sweet exchange that this is, I think, where Alice kind of came into play in Mexico was um, one of the days the dad had gone to work. He was picking in the fields all day, which, mind you, they make $7 a day all day long picking in these fields. Like that is so such hard work. Even when I go and pick like blueberries or strawberries for an hour, it's like, wow, I'm tired. But doing that to provide for their families. Came back up, he was working with us, and then we had a lunch break. So we pack a bunch of sandwiches and the families will come and eat with us as well. Well, the dad had left. He walked back down this, um, this mountain to the nearest store and bought everyone pop. So that was just the, the sweetest thing to see. Like he wanted to provide for us in some way. That was that exchange of value. He owned the land, but there was another layer of, okay, you guys are doing something for me. I'm working with you. Let me take care of you. And it was probably money that he didn't have left over to spend. But there is that dignity piece that we talk about with Alice in the United States. And again, we see it in Mexico. So you almost could say that he hired all of you for the cost of pop. Oh, yeah. Like you came down, you provided the labor, and he wasn't going to just take a handout. He really wanted to make sure that he could uh, make this uh, a dignity thing for him, mm -hmm. him by paying for it. And so by going down and buying pop for everybody, which you probably could have bought your own pop, mm -hmm. uh, you probably didn't need it. It was a great gesture, a welcome gesture, but it, it was the meaning behind it. It was, uh, I don't want this for free. Mm -hmm. um, your time down here means something to me. And you were able to have an exchange. And I think when you make something like a business exchange, I know we've talked about this in the past, but we could just flush this out a little bit. Uh, it's the difference between when you give a handout, you're robbing a person of their dignity but when it's a business deal, then you maintain that dignity. So so it could have seemed like you went down there and you, you on the surface, you're taking something from him. But he's like, oh, no, I'm not going to have any part of that. Uh, I'm going to pay for it. So I'm going to go buy pop for everybody. And isn't it wonderful? You guys were probably so gracious when you got the pop mm -hmm. that it would be like paid in full. All of our labor for one pop, paid for the flight, paid for all mm -hmm. the lodging, the car, the house, I mean, the materials for the house are all paid for with a can of pop. Yes. And I think it's easy too in those situations to be like, oh, no, no, no. Like, you don't have enough money. Like, please, like, you guys take that. But something we had to keep assessing was like, okay, it's their choice what they are providing for us. If they want to provide something or something is a gift, take it. Like, this is that exchange. This is allowing them to have that dignity and their part. And like, this is my house. And I'm building this with you. Um, and it's so interesting, the difference of America and Mexico. So I would say Alice is the same, but the way that the government is set up in America versus Mexico, um, Mexico government does not give any handouts. They don't give anything for free. They have never given $1 to their citizens. And so when you are giving something and when we essentially like gave them a house, even though they worked for it, they owned the land, there was that exchange value. The heart response is like, this is too much. Like, I don't deserve this. Like, how can we ever thank you? And it seems like in America, you give someone something and it's, 
I need more. It's not enough. This is expired. It's not good enough. And it, it like a lot of times what we give here is expired, but there is just like such that heart difference where you can argue in Mexico, even those in poverty can be considered Alice because they want there to be some exchange and there is no safety net. Okay. Let's talk more about that. Uh, be, before we go on, mm -hmm. I, I want to go back to something that you talked about. Um, just to make sure that everybody understands why this is so valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, before we talk about Alice down in Mexico and in Guatemala and even here, uh, I want to go back because the the house was unaffordable for them. Yes. Their conditions, their living conditions were um, probably nobody in America, unless you're homeless uh, in a city, um, you probably couldn't imagine the living conditions. I mean, I used to live in Guatemala for two years and the living conditions of the people we worked with are, um, I, I don't have the word, heartbreaking. Yes. Because, um, but that's what they have. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't get out of that. They were trapped in that. And what you did by providing the labor is you gave them a way out. You made the unaffordable house affordable with a can of pop mm -hmm. as payment but payment was exchanged, now it became affordable. And why I think this is so important is when we think about um, here in America, for every community, we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to make the unaffordable affordable. How do we make food affordable? How do we make housing affordable? How do we make transportation affordable? Not free, mm -hmm. nobody wants free, that's the dignity part of it. So really what you did is you went down there and said, um, if we provide supplies and we provide our labor, then the barrier is removed, payment is exchanged, the person can walk away with dignity and say, I bought my house, you know, and we'll all mm -hmm. wink and go, you bought your house for a can of pop, mm -hmm. um, but you bought your house. Mm -hmm. And and you knew that going into that. Um, and that was amazing that you were able to do what you did. It's no different, let's see, now let's pull this back to America, that when people give of their time here and serve, like in our grocery store, people serve, it's all volunteer run, and people are paying five cents over what we paid for it. And the exchange is made, you know, the monetary exchange, I give you money for food, um, but we use our labor to make the unaffordable affordable. It's the exact same thing. This is why this is such a key podcast, is you did the same thing in Mexico that's happening here. Mm -hmm. It just looked differently. Because you get a whole house for a can of pop instead of five cents over what we pay for it. That's the difference. Yes. Okay. I want to go on. You you touched on this, but I think there's a real key, Lindsay, and I want to ask you more about this. So uh, here in America, we have um, a, a government that is underwriting. Um, that all started from our podcast. We learned that back in 1911. Um, and then also with the New Deal and then the Great Society of the 60s. Uh, all of this worked together so that now our country has a safety net. Mm -hmm. So we've classified people as Alice, meaning um, they're between thirty and seventy-two thousand dollars for a family of four. But the thirty thousand and below are our safety net. Uh, that's where people have access to resources. So what you're telling me though is that in, it's different in Mexico, and it's the same in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no thirty thousand dollar poverty because there's no safety net. So the safety net goes away. So if you're working, but you're not surviving, you could be Alice at $7 a day. Is that what you're telling us? Yeah, yeah. I okay, think Walk with, through that a little bit more. Yes. I think without that safety net, like you said, there is no difference between poverty or Alice. Everyone is Alice, whether you're making $7 a day or maybe you have another layer of education, which is another really big barrier there. A lot of people don't even like finish elementary school. And so um, no matter what social class you're at, no matter how much you're making a day, there are no separations with this safety net. And I don't think the answer is, well, let's give them a safety net then. I think we've seen that at play in America and it's not working. There are more people entering into poverty and there are a lot of more people in poverty that want their way out, but they are trapped by the safety net because they know the second they cross that barrier into receiving no government assistance, they end up in Alice in America where it's impossible to pay for things at retail price, um, but they're not getting, getting anything from the government for free. And so there's this huge 
chasm for need. Yeah, I think we created a safety net in the 60s. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go back to the Great Society, now we I know we talked about it, but I just want to touch on it just a tad. We really thought as a nation um, that under Linda B. Johnson's policies, that if we gave people the safety net and we gave him all of these material goods, that it would rise them out of poverty and we would, in fact, the whole idea was to eradicate poverty once and for all. And actually what you just said is we just um, entrapped them. So our safety net has entrapped people into poverty. And when we say entrapped, it's because um, we give in, in terms of um, subsidy to people that are in poverty, um, we give in subsidy about 85% of what they need. Um, and that just means that if you're going to encourage somebody who's in poverty, getting sub, you know, that safety net, getting things or money or food or rent, um, they would have to work 40 hours to only get a 15% additional. And I think that's where we've really hurt ourselves with our policies. So you're saying that in Mexico, when you don't have a safety net, everybody is in the same boat. Mm -hmm. Now, the only part that you didn't talk about was there's probably some people that are incapable of working. Yes. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. And so in that case, that is where we can provide things for free. So, um, okay. But in to... Mexico, think yes. about it. Who's the, we can provide something for free. Mm -hmm. So, so think about the culture in Mexico and yes. I can talk about Guatemala, Okay. but think about the culture in Mexico. If you have a system where you have a few, some people who can't provide for themselves, um, who's the they? Who mm -hmm. helps them? Each other. Like, I think that was another really big difference is that as we were working on this house, there were people coming in, neighbors, um, different, because this is a very populated mountain area. Like, there were a lot of people in the same kind of living conditions and tents and um, under tarps and they would come over and help and work for the day. And these were not people related to the family. There was another group that came in another, uh, like a couple and they brought over, um, a meal for the family to eat and kind of take, take part in. And so I think that is another really big difference is in Mexico, there was this communal nature to them where it was all of the people living there living with one another, going through life every single day, bearing each other's burdens, um, celebrating like these people, maybe they didn't have a house like they were getting built, but they came and they helped and they worked. They provided a meal. I think we lose that in America. We're very individualized in every man for himself and pick yourself up by the bootstraps. And it's not often that you see somebody helping out another person um, just to take care of them. I think in America, we call that donor fatigue, and we haven't talked about that. Donor fatigue comes in with, why should I help somebody when they can just go ask for it and get it for free? And so uh, it, there's almost like a competition of, you know, somebody going, um, getting food um, on a bridge card or whatever it is that, that it's called in each state. Um, and then people are like fatigued with giving when they already have it. Um, but you know, there is one group in America that does a lot of what you're saying, and we can learn so much for them, but we don't, is the Amish. Hmm. See, the Amish pretty much keep to themselves, but you've heard the term barn raising. It's because a whole community comes over and then they build a barn for somebody. So they're, they're helping one another instead mm -hmm. of relying on government benefits. Mm -hmm. And I love that in our, in our culture. But short of like the Amish, which is a cultural aspect, um, Mexico, because there's no safety net, it demands others to help. Otherwise, people would just starve. Um, now, I watched this in Guatemala. I just want to reference that for yeah. just a moment because uh, when I would go into communities, uh, if there's one concept that I know we talk a lot about, um, keep your hands in your pockets. Um, I had a buddy, Miguel Antonio Manuel, um, who was my partner uh, when I was in Guatemala for those two years. And he, actually said, put your hands in your pockets physically. And he would just look at me and give me this look. And I knew what he meant, put my hands in my pockets. Because when you put your hands in your pockets, you have nothing to give a person except you. You have no food, you have no money, you have nothing. Hmm. So when somebody would approach us and need something, he'd look at me 
And I would smile and I'd put my hands in my pockets because he's like, don't you dare give a thing. Don't. You're disrupting our culture. Hmm. In your culture, you're used to giving, but in our culture, don't. Let us help each other in our culture. Don't come on. Don't come in as the American. Disrupt it by handing things out because that's our culture. So who were the people in that context asking for money? Was that Alice? Could that be considered poverty? Poverty? What was the difference there? Well, I would tell you the people that were asking the most for money were, were people that were disabled. Mm. Um, they might have, you know, no legs. So they'd be sitting on the ground and they would just be having a handout, mm-hmm. you know, give me something. Um, a lot of drunks. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people come up and, and um, who were drunk and they wanted money. Um, but when you got into the villages that we worked with, they had a communal support system when they would have, say, a widow um, or an orphan or somebody in their community. They would take turns caring for that person, and they would give them extra. They would give them what they needed to live because they also knew that they were taking it from a family who didn't hardly have enough for themselves. But they would take a little bit of what they had and they would give it to somebody else who had nothing. Mm. So that was their support system. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, when you have a safety net, um, even though Linda B. Johnson thought we're going to eradicate poverty, my goodness, we enslaved a whole population. And, And that's why today, this is why we're talking about what we've learned with you have poverty, you have Alice, Alice are people that are working. And yet we keep hearing from people. I mean, this has been great. You know, we've been watching this you know, the podcast go, um, social media go, we're hearing back so much from people that are in this saying, we're struggling, we're surviving, and it's been really hard. So, yeah. okay, I want to go back to, so Mexico. Mm-hmm. Did you find that the principles of, of what's happening here in Midland, Michigan, are the principles working when you go down to Guad- uh, to Mexico? Yeah, um, I would say that they are. I think that... Um like everything we've talked about, the exchange of um, the father of the household providing the pop. He walked down, he had that small exchange. There was um, a community of people there providing for one another. I think I even reflect back on a moment where there was a a pregnant mom walking down the mountain to kind of see what was going on and and talk about, is there any way that she could qualify for for getting a house built? And um, she needed diapers as well. And so our project leaders actually had diapers in the back of her car. And so like the pregnant mom, she was very pregnant. (laughs) So it probably (laughs) would not be great for her to carry up these, these diapers up the mountain. I mean, that's something that she couldn't have done for herself. And Nancy, our project leader kind of recognized, okay, I don't, that's something I could do for her. But um, having even just a little bit of sweat equity in the the game. Like she had, a, I think, a son up and she's like, all right, well, I can't carry up these diapers by myself. So if you want them, you're going to have to figure out how to come get them kind of thing. Yeah. And I think she would have, if if she had no other person, she would have walked them up with her. But sure enough, her son, son comes down and he carries them up with him. So there is just this very applicable model of how Alice looks in Midland, Michigan, of how it looks in America versus how it it operates in Mexico. And I think if anything, it is incredibly validating how it runs in Mexico because we can see what it looks like to care for your community without government assistance. Um, And so I think the government assistance in America has kind of clouded some things for us, but I think it just puts the charge back on communities to say, okay, as a community, we need to step up we need to provide affordable solutions. The answer is not to just continue giving out more and more welfare and more and more giveaways, um, but to create affordable solutions to preserve dignity and to empower families. No matter where you live. No matter where you live. And I just want to talk about the negative of this, and then we're probably going to wrap things up. Uh, when I was in Guatemala for those two years, I would receive uh, all of these groups. That was part of my role to receive all these groups from America. Uh, I watched the negative. So I would say uh, for anybody who's listening, if you are part of a church or group that goes overseas, um, hear this as a word of caution. Because when you go into a community and you have wealth, and the reason why I say you have wealth is you get to go there, but they can't come here. They don't have the money to come here. And that was really like a telling moment for me. Like, you're rich. No, I'm not. Yes, you are. And we got in an argument. No, I'm not. 
They're like, you're in my country and I can't go to your country. You're rich. Got me. Mm -hmm. You're right. So when Americans go to another country, it makes them feel really good when they bring all this candy and they're handing all this stuff out, right? Mm -hmm. And they're doing all of this stuff like, oh, we brought all this stuff for you guys. Here's some tools. Here's this. Here's that. And you're handing it all out. And then the Americans, I would listen to them because I was part of their groups for the week. Uh, they felt like a superhero mm -hmm. of what they were able to do for these people, right? Mm -hmm. And then they went home. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is what they don't know. I hope everybody's listening. I kept working with those villages. I was on cleanup duty. They were devastated. They said we were made to feel like nothing. Like they reminded us of how poor we were. They reminded us of what we didn't have. They brought in for a week to survive as Americans more than these people owned. And so when you see that happening, it left the people there devastated. It was just like, it would be better if they didn't come. Mm -hmm. Because when they showed up with all their stuff, um, it was just a reminder that you guys are really poor and we have to come and do this for you. And they walked home, flew home, patting themselves on the back, high-fiving, what, what an amazing week. And yet the people, I would say it took me usually four to six weeks of saying to them, you have value. Mm -hmm. God really loves you. I'm sorry you felt that way. I'm sorry you were treated that way. Um, I'm sorry they robbed you of your dignity. Um, you have great value. Um, and I just felt like I was just like wow. day after day after day trying to build them back up. After one week of after work. After one week of work when Americans went into another place. So, mm -hmm. so part of where this podcast is, I think the real value of this is when you do it in your own community, that doesn't happen because you're still in your community. Mm -hmm. Communities need to serve their communities. Yes in a way of dignity, because we know our communities, we know how to serve our communities. And when we go to another culture and we're, we're applying our principles into another culture, oftentimes we're doing a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And so if we could just somehow say to people, stop, stop doing that stuff mm -hmm. and walk across the street and mm -hmm. figure out how to work with somebody in your own community in a dignified way yeah. to help them help themselves. Mm -hmm. And the heroes we, if you will, if you want to use that word, should be by serving with our hands in our pockets. Yeah. Yeah. That's an incredibly humbling word. And I think we just got to get back to the days of borrowing a cup of sugar, asking the neighbor for milk, like those small things, creating a community that cares for one another. And you've said this before, but you can't out local the local church and right. so to just do that here, if we can do it over there, we for sure can care for our community here. Absolutely. So Ed, what could um, what could a call to action be? What can listeners do um, throughout the week between now and when they hear the next podcast? Oh, Lindsay, I haven't thought about that for this one. Uh, so if I think about it for just a moment, um, for anybody who's been on an overseas mission, uh, I think I would ask God to bless the people that they went and served. And just, God, I didn't know. I didn't know. And I went overseas and I didn't know and I might have done some damage and I didn't know and I'm sorry. Uh, please bless the people mm -hmm. that we want to serve. And I would really lift them up in prayer. Mm -hmm. um, that we can learn from our mistakes. And I think we could do them in our own communities. But I think we have to keep um, putting this before everybody to pay attention. What's in your community? What are the needs in your community? So maybe a call to action would be really simple. Um, find somebody, anybody, anybody in your community, even a friend. Just go up and say, what do you think the needs are in our community? And start finding out what these needs are. Um, go up to a stranger. Hey, I got a crazy question for you. What do you think the needs are in our community? Ask anybody. They'll tell you. That's where the church should be starting, from a place of need. Yeah, that's great. All right, listeners. Well, thanks for going beyond the border with us today. And we will be back next week with another episode. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Beyond the Breakwater, a podcast of Elevate Community Ministries. Don't let the conversation stop here. You can email us at hello at beyondthebreakwater.org. We would love to chat with you, answer questions, plan a visit, and help you take your next step. We'll see you next week.